Um, so there's this repo that I work on that I've shown off a couple times recently, but not everyone's been here and it's called the substrate recipes. And it contains a bunch of examples about stuff you can build on substrate. So we've got entire nodes, we've got just the run times, which you can install into the nodes. And then we've got a bunch of individual palettes, which you can install in the run times. And right now I'm on the master branch and you can see the latest thing we did was release uh, RC2. Um, but the code I'm showing today actually came in after the RC2 release. So it's not yet on master, but it is on develop, which is sort of like where all of the, uh, all the code merges in as we write it. And then it gets merged to master when we're ready to release. Um, oh, and you can even see the latest commit is relevant to this. It's talking about VEC set. Um, so Maybe I'll just start by introducing uh, a few palettes that are in this repo that we're going to use and then I'll uh, and then I'll start to go through the exercise. So I'm going to switch off of GitHub and I'm going to switch to my code editor. But I am like if you want to follow along either now or later, I just always like to tell like exactly what the starting point is. I've checked out this develop branch of the recipes. So that's where we're at right now. Uh, I guess maybe even just to be like a little more explicit, I checked out that develop branch and then I made a fresh branch in case we end up committing anything today. So in the palettes directory, there's this palette called check membership. Um, and I'll show you it's librs file and it's kind of a funny one. I did something sort of unique in this, in this crate, I guess is the right way to call it. So it, you know, normally when you're in a palette and you look at the librs file, this is where you see all of the like, you know, decal module, decal error, and all of the dispatchable calls and all of that stuff. But in this case, all I'm doing is exporting these two like sub modules called loose and tight. And basically I've written the same palette twice with a, a subtle difference between them. And the subtle difference is how they are connected to another palette, which they're going to use to manage their membership set. So uh, maybe in order to start demonstrating that, I'll just jump into the tight variant because that's the one that we're going to use first. So, uh, okay, so now I'm in check membership, source tight, and now like this is probably a more normal looking substrate palette. Um, so what it does is it demonstrates access control check. So there's like, you guys have probably encountered permissions and all kinds of things. Like, you know, maybe you want to push a commit to GitHub and you're like not a contributor for that repo. So you can't push there. Or maybe you're like trying to log into some particular uh, like laptop and you don't have an account there, so you can't do it. So that's basically what, what access control means. And the way that we've implemented it here is that there's a vector of account IDs. So you can imagine like Alice, Bob, Xavier, and Hernando are like the approved people. Their account IDs are in this vector of account IDs. And so therefore, when they try to call this uh, check membership method, they can do it and anyone else can't. And so I, I'll just look through this um, extrinsic really quick. So. It only takes one parameter, which is like always taken in frame palettes. And this is the person who called it, or I guess it's not even always a person. It's like where the call came from. But then we do ensure signed, which uh, that makes sure it was like a, a user, like an account. And uh, in addition to like checking the signature, we're able to extract exactly who this thing, who the caller was. So like if, if I were to go to the apps UI or any blockchain UI and call this check membership thing, then caller would be my account ID. Um, and so, so great. Now we know who's calling. Next thing we do is we want to get the members like that, that list of approved people who are allowed to call. And the way we do it is we actually call into a different palette. So this check membership palette isn't responsible for managing the set of members. It actually uses a different palette that I've called VEC set. It's a, you know, it uses a vector to manage this membership set, like I said. Um, and so we grab the members out of that palette. Uh, and so then we do the thing that, you know, probably everybody was expecting. We take that set of members, we search through it to see if the caller is in there. And if the caller's not there, then we throw this not a member error and, and that's it. Nothing happens. Um, and, you know, like in, if this were not just a minimal example, if this were like a real piece of runtime code after you've done this check, now you can go on to do like whatever it is that this extrinsic is supposed to do. And since this is a minimal example, in our case, it basically just, it, 
like emits this particular event that says whoever called it was a member. Um, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll pause there actually and see if there's any questions about this palette and then next we'll install it in a runtime. So it's part of the VEXAT um, palette that the members are sorted and that's why we can rely on it here. Is that the contract? Yeah, yep, that's exactly right. So let me actually show how that relationship exists. So like every frame palette has this trait, it's called trait. I like to refer to it as the configuration trait. And uh, like most of the time in a frame palette, it typically looks like this, where you just say like my own configuration trait is bounded by the system trait. And then you have all these like associated types in there. So what I've done here is I've added an additional trait bound to the VEXAT trait. And basically what that says or what it does is it says this check membership palettes, you know, specifically this tight, tightly coupled version. Um, this is the tight coupling. It says this palette can only be installed in a runtime that also implements the VEXAT trait. Or another way to say that is like, it can only be installed in a runtime that also has the VEXAT palette installed in that same runtime. Um, My question is how to get to know from the source code point of view, whether the palette is runtime or not. Is it some, some simple or not simple, but yeah. I, I, I know that from the documentation I can find it, but I just wanted to get to know, to, go, to get the idea from this source point of view. There is yeah. any... Oh. So let me make sure I got your question. Your question was, how do you know by looking at the code, like whether a palette is installed in the runtime or not? Which, which one is runtime and which one is not runtime. But from Ooh, looking- You're saying like, if I just give you a piece of substrate code and I ask you like, Tamash, is this a palette or is it a runtime? Exactly. Like, how do you know? Okay, yeah, great question. Thank so you. what we're looking at right now is a palette and it has a couple of characteristic pieces of code and they're these macros. Deckle this, deckle that, deckle something else. Oh, I see you leaning in, so let me make that bigger. Um, decal event, decal error. The most important one is decal module. These palettes used to be called runtime modules and sometimes still are. So like if you see these macros or this uh, pub trait trait, then you know you're looking at a palette. And if it's like a, you know, sort of a nicely documented one, probably this code, there's docs at the beginning and it says like, you know, this palette does something or, or other. And then on the other side is a runtime. So let me just show you a runtime. Um, I guess we'll do this kitchen or super runtime. Uh, and, you know, there's a bunch of characteristic pieces here though, but they all, uh, I mean, it's a bunch of type aliases. So let me show you the parts that I always think of as most characteristic of a runtime. One is this, every runtime has to declare it, uh, like it's runtime version struct or instance mm -hmm. of the runtime version struct. And then there's usually a series of trait implementations. So there's a bunch of these, impl timestamp trait, and then down below, impl balances trait. This is, there's a trait for every palette in the runtime. So uh, like we were just looking at uh, check membership. So let's find that one. Here it is. Uh, in fact, we were looking at the tight version of check membership. So here's its trait. And then the final sort of like, I guess there's two more blocks that are really characteristic of a runtime. One is this construct runtime macro where it lists all the palettes. There's a lot in this one. The mm -hmm. typical runtime has fewer palettes than this, but there's a bunch here. And then the final, the final piece is this macro impl runtime APIs. So if you're implementing the runtime APIs, you must be a runtime. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. That's, that's a good question. Joshi, can I add a little bit to that? Yeah, please do. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll, I put on my hat to hide my dirty hair. So I might as well turn on my video. Um, I think that was a, a really good like description of kind of looking at a piece of code as a standalone unit and figuring out how to kind of like orient yourself. I mean, that's something I definitely struggled with and continue to struggle with. So that's certainly super valuable, but just to kind of uh, add to that, um, if you're looking at more of like a, an entire project, um, 
typically there's some conventions that are followed, which is that there may be like a folder called runtime and then another folder called, you know, client or node or something like that. And so that's one way that you can help kind of orient yourself within a substrate code base. Um, and then just one more kind of piece of information to level set is that anytime you are talking about a frame palette, you are talking about something that's part of a runtime. A, a frame palette, do, it doesn't make sense outside of a substrate runtime. Yeah, so I just opened the node template real quick. This is probably a helps. good example of the file structure you were talking about. Is this what you were thinking of, Dan? Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, cool. So like, yeah, runtime folder, palettes folder. So you can tell like template is a, a palette, for example. Um, and, and in substrate terminology, a palette is a rust crate, a rust module that belongs to this frame framework. And any palette that is part of the frame framework is meant to be included in a substrate runtime. So that's another way to kind of orient yourself when you're looking at code. If you are looking at a frame palette, you are looking at something that's meant to be part of a substrate runtime. Um, yeah, I just okay. see the big value in the runtime mode and I was really curious about that. And thank you for the great explanation. Yeah, good, good question. So maybe I'll just show this Vexet palette real quick too. So this is the thing that actually manages the membership set or like from its own, from the Vexet's own perspective, it's just managing some set of account IDs. It has no idea what it's gonna be used for, or even really if it's gonna be used for anything useful. It just knows my job is to manage this set. And so the way we do it is a single storage item called, I you know probably shouldn't have even called it members here. I could have just called it like accounts or whatever, um, but it's just a, a vector of account IDs. And then it has, um, it has two dispatchable calls. So those always go in Deckle module. One is to add a new member. And basically what we do is like, you know, same thing, we see who called this and then we, uh, we make a couple checks. One check is that there's only allowed to be so many members in this palette. So like, you know, if there's already 16 members, which is the hard coded maximum and I try to join, then I can't join. Um, another thing that could happen is like, I might already be a member and then try to join. And so that also gives me an error, this already member error. And then like the, the happy condition is when we, when we searched through the member list, we didn't find the person who called. And so then we go ahead and we insert them and then we write that back into storage and emit the success event that some member got added. Um, yeah, so, so that's basically the two palettes. Check membership does the actual check against the list to say like, hey, are you allowed to call this thing? And Vexet does the mem uh, managing of the membership set. So what I wanna do now, like I, I actually just showed when I was answering Tomasha's question that these are already installed in this uh, like super runtime that comes with the recipes. But what I kinda wanna do is go through the process of like starting a minimal one and then upgrading our chain as we go. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to take, I'm going to start with this super runtime, which is like a pretty uh, general purpose runtime, except it just contains a, like a ton of pallets. And so I'm going to duplicate it and I'm going to make a brand new runtime that we'll use for our purposes. And uh, this one, we're going to try to hopefully get to storage migrations by the end. So I'm just going to call this one migration station. That's the name of our runtime. And uh, so like, just to go through the process, there's, we don't need these uh, types files or we'll regenerate them if we do, but I'm gonna delete them for now. So we're down to like a pretty normal runtime and I'll start in its cargo.toml and just go through and like uh, update some of this code. So this can be like seminar participants, um, a runtime that, seminar will use to demonstrate runtime upgrades. And um, there's all these recipes palettes in here that we don't need. So I'm just gonna ditch them all. And uh, same thing in this STD feature, there's all these recipe palettes down here and I'm gonna delete those. 
So that looks pretty good. And then in the actual runtimes uh, source code, you know, we can like a runtime to demonstrate uh, runtime upgrades. So like, I'll just go through all the code. Like most of this stuff doesn't have to change. A lot of it is like really boilerplate-y. I'll change this. We don't want it to be called super runtime. Do it twice. And so this spec version and impl version, these are things we're going to actually be using and messing with today, but not yet. Because right now we're just creating our initial version of this runtime. So we're gonna leave these at one. And then the upgrades we do will demonstrate like what both of these two mean. We aren't going to touch the transaction version or the authoring version in this demo though. Um, so this all looks good. And then I have a comment in here where it says, yeah, these are the configurations for the recipes palette. So like we're just deleting all of this. Basically what I'm doing is taking this runtime and just stripping it down to like a minimum runtime. So same thing, we'll ditch all of these recipe palettes. Boom. And, uh, and I think that's pretty much good. If I remember right, there's one little use line up here, this one. So because check membership has those two variants, the tightly coupled one that we looked at and then a loosely coupled one that we'll look at later, I had to sort of import them in this weird way. So uh, we're gonna have to get rid of this line. And I think that's it, but as usual, the compiler can can tell us whether we're good to go there or not. Oh yeah, one other thing is like, since we're working inside of this big repository, every time you add a package, you have to add it to the main cargo.toml also. So that's this one. And so I'll add it right here. Uh, okay, so let's just see if it, if it compiles and if it does, we're almost ready to start our chain then. Go check dash P. Migration station. Failed to read that cargo.toml file. No such file. Uh, okay, I saw the problem. This should be run times. Okay, there we go. All right. So basically the idea is if this thing builds, which it either will build right now or it'll have some small error. Okay, great, it built. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna install it into a node. So like, kind of like how Dan was saying, if you're writing a palette, it's because you want it to be used in a runtime. Same thing here, if you're writing a runtime, it's because you want it to be used in a node. And instead of starting from scratch, I'm just gonna recycle the kitchen node. I think one thing that's really cool about Substrate is how easy it is to like mix and match pieces between the blockchain. So in the kitchen node, one of its dependencies is the runtime. And I've got these comments set up already so that you can easily choose like any of these runtimes that come with the recipes. There's a bunch of them here. So like you can see, you can use the super runtime, which we're not gonna do. You could use the wait fee runtime, the OCW runtime, that's like off-chain workers. Uh, there's one that shows how to do a custom runtime API, but we're actually gonna do the one we just created, uh, runtime to demo upgrades. And it's this one. Migration station. And, uh, and then we just give it the path. Like this is where you'd either give it a version from crates or a GitHub dependency or something, but it's in this very same folder. So I'm just gonna type it like this. And I think that's it. And so now we'll be able to build the kitchen node. And luckily I've done like most of the pre-compiling here. So our compiles shouldn't take too long. Yeah. And I guess like also just to, compile time is a good time to talk through the plan. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna launch a, a blockchain with this kitchen node that we're building with our migration station runtime. Uh, we're gonna like make a couple little transactions just to make sure everything works. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do our first upgrade, which installs those two palettes that we toured earlier, the check membership palette and the Vexet palette. So even with our live chain running, we're gonna go ahead and like change our runtime code and then do the on-chain runtime upgrade. Yeah. Okay, cool, there we go. Uh, so, 
So here we go. I'm basically going to do, I'm going to make a chain spec. So you don't have to make a chain spec every time, um, but I think it's a cool thing. You can do a substrate and, uh, and I just want to show how to do it. So uh, maybe I'll set, I also want to do this. So we built our node to uh, target release kitchen node, which is the normal place. And I just want to copy it like right here to the root directory and I'll call it like, original binary and I'm doing that just to be sure we don't accidentally like overwrite it with a future build. Um, so, and I guess I'll do the same thing for the runtime wasm. So the, the runtimes build to target release W build uh, and then like the name of whatever thing you, you built so that ours was migration station. And then here's the entire runtime wasm blob migration station dot compact dot wasm. And I, again, same thing. I'm just going to copy it right to the recipes root directory and I'm going to call it like um, original runtime.compact.wasm. So now we've got this binary and uh, this original runtime. So let's run it. The original binary. I'll just make sure there's nothing like left over from when I was practicing or getting prepared. Um, oh, not, not yet though. I need to make my chain spec first. So let's do that. Original binary build spec um, and I'll output it to this. And I want to build a raw spec, which means that all the exact storage locations for like any of our Genesis configs, like initial balances and anything are like hard coded in there. I should say like they're already turned into the raw storage keys. So if you then try to run this chain on a different platform or something, you're sure you're going to get the storage in the right place. This basically raw is what you do when you're starting a production chain. So it created that file for us and then we'll just check it out here. Um, so it's, it's pretty standard. Uh, like here's the part where you can see it's raw cause this is all just hex encoded storage. So like using this raw chain spec, we wouldn't be able to change our Genesis config or anything. You can do that with a non raw spec, but not here, but that's totally okay. Cause all I wanted to do for this one is uh, like change a couple little things like this. So we can call it like, Migration station and then chain type. I'm going to set this to development. And this is like uh, literally all this does is it tells the apps UI like, hey, this is just a screwing around for learning purposes chain. Uh, and then the apps UI will include those prefunded like Alice, Bob, Charlie accounts. So it's really just a, a convenience thing. Um, this is our own boot node in here. I'll just leave it like maybe we'll start a couple more nodes later on. I don't I don't know. And then we'll put this uh, telemetry thing in here so that we can see our network on the telemetry. And I, I copied over what we need to do that. So here's my notes. If I don't know if anyone looked at them, it's totally fine either way, but uh, this is how you like put in your chain spec telemetry endpoints. So any node that uses this chain spec will send telemetry to the proper place unless we uh, give it a command line flag not to. So good. So we've saved it. And so now we can start our chain. Original binary. Uh, I'm going to purge the chain, like I said, just in case. And the way we tell it to use that custom spec we just made is like this. Uh, dots are uh, like just chain equals like whatever, uh, you know, file we want to use. So, okay, removed. So good thing I did that because there was something left over from my testing. And so now we can start our chain. Chain equals spec.json. And I'll just, just give it Dave. He'll be my validator. Okay, and this looks good. Everything's pretty normal. Our node's running. It's going to give us these idle messages. Um, and, you know, if you probably know this if you were at some previous seminars or have messed with the recipes, but you might not if you're new here. This is an instant seal node, which means it's not going to create any blocks until there's a transaction in the transaction pool. And then when there is, it's going to instantly create a block to like sort of include that transaction in the chain. So I guess our first step is just to make sure this is working. Um, so in my web browser, polkadot.js.org, like this is the standard, uh, interface. And I like to test it out just by sending some transfers. So let's have Bob's or Alice send Bob some tokens. And that's cool. It seems like it worked. One nice thing about instant seal is we don't have to wait six seconds for these to go in. Um, I should probably be on this tab just so we can really see if these are going through. So, um, looks like Alice sent a transaction. So that's good. I don't know why it's not showing the balances. Let me check my types. Oh yeah, that looks good. 
refresh the page. Oh, cool. There's the balances. I don't know what was up with that, but it seems normal now. So Alice's balance went down and Bob's went up. So I think this chain is working. That's great. We don't need to like mess around with it for too long. I guess in the log, it's worth noting that a block was created when I sent a transaction, but not before and not after. Uh, hey, Joshua. Yeah, you, go ahead. Yeah. So this is something new to me. I mean, this instance ceiling. So was it uh, recently to substrate or what is it? Yeah, so instant seal got added a couple months ago, um, but it wasn't really like used or anything. And so the, the guy who wrote it, his name is uh, Shayun Lonledge. He's a parody guy and he was on the seminar like, feels recent to me, but it might've been like a month and a half ago. And um, we integrated it into a recipes node. And so now uh, most of the recipes nodes use it. But instant seal itself does come with substrate. Maybe let me just sort of shill that recipe real quick. Um, so if you go to like the rendered version of the recipes, there's one down here. There's one for manual seal, which is similar. And it, uh, it basically authors a block whenever you send an RPC command to do it. And then here's the one, it's like kitchen node. That's the thing I started from. And it talks about how to do all of the uh, instant seal stuff. So there, this is where it starts. You know, it tells you what crates to import and like what code modifications you need to make in your service.rs. And then um, like whenever you're in doubt, if like, you know, let's say you read over this and you like basically get it, but for some reason it doesn't compile. Whenever you're working with the recipes, you can always just look at all the complete code is right there already. And so like when you're doing manual seal or instant seal or really any consensus change, service.rs is the interesting place. But uh, is it a solid uh, module for normal chains or just for development? Oh, yeah. For like, if you're thinking about like your network that's in production, it's, it's not probably very good. One mm. real problem with it is that there's no notion of like having earned the right or been selected to be the correct block author. So like literally anyone can author a block at any time. And mm -hmm. In a real production network, that means there's just going to be blocks flying around left and right, forks everywhere, and so it, I wouldn't recommend it in that case. Yeah, but I remember there was some discussion maybe like half year ago, um, somewhere in some direction, something like this. So if there are no transactions, not to produce blocks. Oh yeah, I don't remember that. What was the context, or what was it about? Uh, so when there, there are no transactions, why do we need to produce empty blocks? Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Like, is it, uh, it seems wasteful to just produce yes, empty yes. blocks, even when there's mm -hmm. no, like, we could just let the chain not be producing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting idea for sure. Yeah. But nothing uh, like this is implemented yet. That's correct. Or it's correct as far as I know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thanks. So what, yeah, if you wanted to do that, basically what you would be doing is, uh, it's not really so much like using a consensus engine, like how I showed in this recipe, it's more like writing your own consensus engine, which is also a really cool and useful thing to do, but I am definitely not an expert on that. <laughs> yeah, um, so, okay, so let's see. I think we were at the part, we're pretty much done with the kitchen node. We're just gonna use it as it is from this point on. Um, so we're pretty much at the part where we wanna update our runtime. So uh, here I am back in migration station uh, and I'll go to its cargo toml first. And so basically we want to add two pallets. And so I'll just add them like this. The first one is check membership. And uh, it's, uh, it's actually called check membership. So I don't need package there. I just need uh, this path is pallets check membership. And, oh, yeah, and the other thing you always need when you're including pallets in your runtime is this. Default features false. And then the other one we're going to do is vexet. So let me just put that in. And then the other thing you have to do is say, like, okay, if we're building the whole runtime to STD, then also build the pallets to STD. So... You can do that here. That looks good. Okay, so they're imported as dependencies. Now we'll add them to our runtime. So I took out that one line because I was saying check membership is weird because it has two variants. So we're gonna use, we're gonna put that back again. 
we're going to use check membership and we're going to use the sort of tight coupled variant and we're just going to call it this check membership type boom okay so uh tomash we're about to start mutating some of those parts of the runtime that i said were like kind of characteristic of a runtime so since we're adding two new palettes we need to implement their traits so we'll impl check membership tight trait for runtime. And it only has this one associated type. This one is like not very interesting to dive into. It basically just lets our palette emit events. And we'll do the same thing for Vexet. We didn't have to use a use for Vexet because this lives right in the root of the crate, which is sort of the more normal way to do it. Okay, that's that. And then we add them both to our construct runtime macro, which will look like this. Um, I'm just gonna give it this human friendly name check membership. I'm gonna omit the tight part. That is more of an implementation detail. And then there's this question about like what features of the individual palette go here. Uh, I don't wanna get too crazy deep into this, but I know that this is a module um, check membership doesn't have any storage of its own. That account, that like vector of members is stored in the other palette in Vexet, but it does have events. Um, and uh, wow, like, let's see what, oh, it has calls. That's how you call, is it check membership? Doesn't have a config. Uh, I think that's it for that one. Compiler will tell me if I'm wrong. And then we can do this one too. Vexet. It's a module, it has calls to add and remove members. It does have its own storage and it has events for like when people get added or removed. And I think that's it for that one, same thing. Uh, compiler will tell me if I'm wrong. I don't know why that highlighted different, but I, I think it's fine. So let's see if that builds. Oh. Okay, and that was the only error, so let's just assume it was right. Cargo build release FP migration station. So basically what I'm doing now is I'm building the WASM binary for our new runtime, the one that includes check membership and Vexet. And now we're gonna do the live runtime upgrade. So I, I'm gonna uh, just double check that I actually updated the thing I updated, which was this target release uh, W build migration station. So here's the file and it got updated at 1038, which is now. Okay, good. So that's the, that's the thing I wanted. So let me just copy that, like we said. Uh, upgrade1.compact.wasm. So, uh, oh, it's hidden by my Zoom thing. So here we go, upgrade one compact wasm. It's awesome, it's built, we didn't have to rebuild our binary. In fact, the thing is still running over here. I didn't even have to change that. So now we're gonna go back into apps and runtime upgrades are just transactions and substrate. Just, I mean, honestly, they're a lot like any other transaction. So you need a governance mechanism to do a runtime upgrade. And in this chain, we're using a really simple one called sudo. And like, uh, you know, in Polkadot and like most other production chains, we have democracy. Definitely that's a better, well, actually in Polkadot right now we have sudo, but like in, once it's fully, you know, in the proof of stake and like fully uh, decentralized, then we'll have democracy. Um, anyway, so I'm gonna call this extrinsic system set code. That's where I set the runtime code. And I'm just going to give it that file that we just created, which was um, upgrade one. And then uh, there's this little subtlety that I got stuck on when I was prepping. And the deal is basically like, this is big. You can see it's 200 kilobytes. Here, maybe now you can see it's 200 kilobytes. And so it would exceed the weight limit of the, of the block. So like when you're using sudo, there's this little thing you can do, which is like, I just tell it whatever weight I want this thing to have. And so basically I'm like bypassing the weight checks, which we're not really talking about weight today. So I think that's a good thing to do. 
So here we go, submitting the transaction. You can see it's coming from Alice just because she's the pseudo key that was specified in the chain spec. And so let's have her do it. And okay, it went through, so that's a good sign. Here we can see like, uh, oh, you know what guys, I think I made one important mistake and I, I made the mistake that I forgot to change the, the runtime version. So let's actually investigate what the consequences of that are and then let's go back and get it right. So like when I come over to extrinsics here, I'm expecting that I should see like Vexat and check membership, but I don't have any of that. And the reason is because since I left it at version one, the UI thinks this is the same old runtime we always had. And so it's not bothering to give me like that, that new stuff in there. So a uh, little detour, but let's go back and get it right. Um, so what I need to do now is change the spec version. And basically anytime you change the way, like the behaviors that your runtime offers to the user, you need to bump your spec version. So like in this case, we added two whole new palettes with their own extrinsics and everything. So for sure we want to change the spec version. Uh, so the bummer is that means we need to, uh, recompile it, but luckily it didn't take stupid long last time. Maybe it won't this time either. Yeah, I will say I do that pretty much every time I do a runtime upgrade. <laughs> um, Ten forty one. That's basically now, so that's good. Okay, so let's copy that again. Target release w build migration station, and uh, we'll just copy it to right over top of upgrade one. Okay, cool. So now we've got the right one. So let's do the upgrade again. And we'll do the new upgrade one. Okay, cool. Oh yeah, look at that. So now version changed to two. Um, we have all the same like code updated. This all looks good and normal. And so now when we go to extrinsics, we do have that new like vex set stuff. So let's just call check membership real quick. And we're calling is Alice and uh, and it gives us this error. And the problem is Alice is not one of the members. So she's not allowed to call this thing. So we can go to the palette that actually manages the membership and we can add Alice and like, okay, great. She's added. If we try to add her again, we get an error because you can't add twice. But like, if we wanted to, we could add Bob. Okay. And so that worked. Um, it might be confusing if I go too fast because we still have events from like previous calls. But what I think I've done is I've added both Alice and Bob. And if we wanted to check, we can go to the chain state and we can read out from the Vexat palette, like who are the members? And there we go. And if you've encountered these accounts very much, you know that five FH new, that's Bob and five GRW, that's Alice. So we've got them in there. So now they should both be able to call uh, check membership. So Bob calls and he's successful and like Charlie's not in there yet. So Charlie should be unsuccessful. Okay, cool. So it seems like our runtime upgrade worked. So I'm pretty happy with that. So I guess maybe I'll just pause there for any questions. I was expecting to see, or maybe I plan to show how to upgrade something that already existed in previous version. Like you have some structure and then you want to decide, you decided to add uh, fields or append or even better, more complex to insert in between other fields. Like for example, you have a user structure and you have a first name, last name, and then you decide to add middle name in between first and last. I, I, I think you, you will have problems with this when upgrading, right? Yeah, you're, I think you're talking about like storage migrations basically. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so that's, we're gonna do that, but not, uh, that's gonna be one of our future upgrades. Mm -hmm. Because this I know this not that. Uh, Today you just added uh, new pilots and I, I think that uh, there are not so much uh, issues with it. It just, yeah, but when exactly. you want to modify something existing. Yeah, so basically the idea is like this, with check membership in Vexet, the only storage item is that member set of members that's in Vexet. And so like when I installed that new palette, it just started out with an empty set, which is exactly what we wanted. So we didn't have to do any storage migrations there. 
what we're going to see at the end is, and to be honest with you, I learned a ton about this in the last few days. So I can even talk about like different ways to do it and we can talk about which one's best. But anyway, what we're going to see at the end is we're going to switch from using a vector to using a map. And so then we have this problem of like, okay, well, Alice and Bob are already stored as members in our VEC. And like, if we switch over to using a map for storage, that's great. But how are we going to get Alice and Bob to still be in there? And so that's the job of a storage migrate. And, and so is the thing you talked about, Alex, where like, if you change the way a structure looks, then you need to update all the existing entries. So those are use cases for storage migrations. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, so let's, let's keep chugging. Uh, so here's what I want to do next. Um, it's time to talk about the loosely coupled variant of this check membership palette. So uh, let's find it. So remember I said there's the tightly coupled and loosely coupled version. So now we're looking at the loosely coupled version. And here's the main difference in the palette's configuration trait. So in the tightly coupled version, I did this. I connected to uh, Vexet trait explicitly here. And so for the loosely coupled version, I'm removing that. And that means it, it eliminates the requirement that in order to use this palette, you must have Vexet also installed. And we replace it with this thing down here. And what this is, it's an associated type, which I've called membership source. And it's a good name. It means we need some other palette that's going to act as a source of information about the membership. So like, who are the members of this, uh, you know, like, I don't know, member, like membership set. And we give it a trait bound and we give it this trait bound called account set. And account set is another thing that I wrote in here that I'll show briefly. Um, it's in traits account set. Here's its code. It's extremely short. Here we go. Pub trait account set. It has one associated type, which is the account ID, and it has one function called accounts. And what it gives us back is a set of account IDs. So basically, this trait just provides an interface over what we were already doing with VEX set anyway. And the beauty is now we're going to be able to couple to different palettes other than explicitly VEX set. So in this runtime upgrade that we're going to do now, we're just switching to the loosely coupled variant and we're still going to have Vexet installed. And then in the next upgrade, that's when we'll switch to a different implementation instead of Vexet. So um, I guess I, I want to show one more thing in check membership. So this is the sort of like the key change or the most important change, I would say. And that's going from like a tight coupling up here where you specify exactly what palette you want to use to a looser coupling where you specify an interface or a trait. And so the other thing I wanted to show is this part down here. In the actual check membership thing, uh, this line looks different. So it used to say like um, Vexat module T uh, accounts or I, whatever it was, members, I think is what it was called. Now we can't refer specifically to Vexat anymore. We have to just refer to this associated type, whatever it was. And we can't call members because the we're only allowed to call methods from the trait and the trait provided this accounts thing. So that's it. So now we can go change the way it works in our runtime, which is migration station librs. Okay, cool. So let me do this part first before I forget like last time. Um, and this time I'm going to bump the implementation version. And the idea is that I'm switching my code around to use the loose coupling instead of the tight coupling. And that's like, better design and, you know, more abstract and all of that stuff. But from an end user's perspective, you know, like when you're submitting transactions over here in the interface, nothing has changed. And so for that reason, I don't have to bump my whole spec version. I only have to bump the implementation version. And now we can go ahead and make our, our code changes. Oh yeah. The first one is up, uh, up at the very top because, Oh, where did that go? Here. I no longer want to use the, the tightly coupled version of check membership, I now want to use loose. Okay, so we can implement our two palettes traits. Here we go. So we're now using check membership loose. Uh, it still has event, but now we have the second associated type called membership source, I think, and the compiler will tell me if I'm wrong. And here we're going to use Vexet. So this is where the coupling happens now in the runtime itself, instead of happening down in the individual palettes. 
So we want to use check membership loose there, and I think everything else can stay exactly as it was. So let's build it. All right, that seems good. And uh, I'll just copy it over again. This is gonna be called upgrade two. That looks awesome. Okay, let's do our upgrade. So we'll go back to the sudo tab, we'll set code and we'll do upgrade two. Okay, and it seems like it went through. This time version stayed at two. So it's this is telling me the spec version and uh, this time it was correct that it stayed at two because I only changed the implementation version. Um, and so, you know, like I think probably everything worked but I always like to just do a few sort of sanity checks to make sure that it worked. And so like I wanna just read my chain state. So let's look at Vexet again and look at the members. So, okay, cool, Alice and Bob were still in there right where we put them. That's no big surprise. We didn't really make any changes to Vexet. Let's make sure check membership still works. So I'm gonna call that function as Charlie. And I'm expecting this to fail because Charlie's not a member. Okay, that worked. And let's make sure that like the people who are members can still call. And, okay, so that might've been a little confusing. That error that was still showing right here was left over from Charlie's call. And you can tell, you know, because like I literally didn't even send Alice's yet. So now I'm gonna send Alice's. Okay, and it looks like she's in the block. So probably like what I should have done was cleared all of those and we'll, we'll just double check for Bob and he's good too. So, okay, cool. So our, our upgrade worked. It didn't make any changes for like end users, but it did change the way the code structure itself worked. So maybe I guess I'll just pause there for any questions before I move on to the next one. Can you tell more about the difference between spec impl and spec and impl version? Because maybe I missed something. Yeah, sure. So like, let me, I'll say it in my own words and then we can look at the docs too. So in, in my own words, where is that thing? Right here. In my own words, spec version changes whenever you're adding or removing or changing the meaning of behavior that your chain offers to a user. So in, in our first runtime upgrade, we added some palettes with their own extrinsics. And so we bumped the spec version. The same thing would be true if we like removed some palettes or extrinsics. The same thing would be true if we like, you know, maybe uh, kept all the same set of extrinsics, but like changed what they did. Like the meaning of it means something different than what it used to mean. Um, an impl version, that's what we changed this particular, this most recent upgrade. And the idea is basically like, you know, if I'm just some average Joe that's using this chain, I'm not like a developer on it. I don't really care that that runtime upgrade happened. Nothing changed. It was just an implementation detail. We switched from tightly coupling to the VEX set palette over to loosely coupling. And like, yeah, maybe the devs thinks that's cool. They're probably correct. Uh, but as a user, I don't care. So that's why we changed the impl version. And then like, I guess, yeah. And like, thank you for not asking about authoring version. I really am not clear on what that one is, but let's look at the docs and, and see, what, see what they have to say. And also there's transaction version. There's <laughs> also transaction <laughs> version. Yeah, yeah, there's a bunch of them. Um, wait, what was that called again? Runtime version. Uh, this is what we want. Okay, so it says this should not be thought of as classic semver. I've seen a lot of people make that mistake. It, it used to be more confusing because it was just authoring spec impl. There wasn't this one. And so people would think of this as like major minor patch, which is totally incorrect. Um, so, okay, it says this triplet, it shouldn't even say triplet anymore, have different semantics. Uh, in particular, bug fixes should result in an increment of spec version. So that's an example. Like if you're fixing a bug, that means your chain used to have one behavior, you considered it buggy, now it has a new behavior that you consider unbuggy. And so because you changed the behavior, you uh, increment the spec version. Um, absolutely not impl version since they changed the semantics of the runtime. So here's impl version that says, uh, oh, sorry, that's not the thing I meant. Here's the impl version. 
version of this implementation of the spec. Nodes are free to ignore this. It serves only as an indication that the code is different. Yeah, so that's interesting. Like if, if I had been using my native runtime uh, to author blocks, it would have been fine for me to continue doing that even though the runtime had upgraded because it was only an implementation change and I should still be authoring compatible blocks. Uh, now that isn't relevant in our situation because I was already not using native authoring because the, the first upgrade uh, broke that compatibility. So let's see what authoring says. Authoring version is the version of the authorship interface and authoring node will not attempt to author blocks unless this is equal to its native version. Um, I guess I kind of get that in an abstract sense, but I'm not really clear on what kind of change would make me have to increment that. Yeah, it's hard to understand the sentence about authoring. Yeah, I, I guess like a way that if I wanted to learn more about this, I would try to change my runtime until something broke and then say like, okay, what was that change that I made that broke this? And maybe that would shed some, some light on it. And then, okay, so transaction version. All existing dispatches are fully compatible when this number doesn't change. Um, oh yeah, that's, that's relevant here. So I think the keyword is existing. And so like in our first update, we added some new extrinsics, but we didn't change the semantics of any of the ones that already existed. Um, oh, so maybe I would need to change that in this next upgrade. Let's read more about it. Let's read. Uh, if this number changes, spec version must also change. This number must change when an existing dispatchable is changed, either through an alteration in its user level semantics or parameters added, removed, or changed. Um, okay, cool. It need not change when a new module is added or when a dispatchable is added. Okay, so it seems like we've, we've done it all correctly so far. Um, so our next goal is uh, now that we have installed this uh, loosely coupled version of check membership, what that means is we can swap around the palette that it's coupled to. So it doesn't have to always be Vexet. It could be this other thing called map set. And so that's, that's what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna actually, without changing check membership itself, I'm gonna change the thing that manages the membership set. And I, I just want to take two little detours before we do it. And one is going to be to export all the blocks in my chain, because if we mess it up, we don't want to have to go through this entire exercise over again from scratch before we try again. And also exporting and importing blocks is just a, a cool thing to do. So let me show you how that works real quick. Um, okay, so here's, here's our node. It's on block 13. And so uh, I'm just going to kill it. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to run the same binary. And I'm going to run export blocks subcommand. Um, and for some reason, you always have to give it pruning archive when you're running this. There's probably a good reason, but I'm not really sure what it is. And then we just have to tell it uh, where we want to put this output. And so I'll just make a file called blocks.json right here in the recipes root. Okay, that looks good. Exporting blocks 1 to 13. And it did give us this new file. I saw it created over here. <laughs> so the... The funny thing is there's two formats that you can use for exporting blocks. You can use the JSON format and the binary format, and this is the JSON format. It still has a lot of, uh, you know, binary looking data in there. I, I don't even know what field that is. I, that's what I was trying to look at. Oh, extrinsics, yeah. Oh, right, and some of our blocks have really big extrinsics because they contained runtime upgrades. So that's gonna be 220 kilobytes of um, of like basically binary data inside the JSON. Uh, but anyway, we don't need to look through this. It's just like the point is it exists. And so now all our blocks are exported. And um, so the idea is like, if we, if we botch this upgrade, then um, we'll be able to, to start over where we left off. In fact, yeah, we don't, we, I, I almost said like, let's purge our chain and do that. Let's yeah, let's do it. I'm going to, Purge the chain here. Okay, so we're we're back down to empty blockchain, and I can just prove it by uh, if I start a chain again, it starts over at block zero. Um, so let me purge that empty chain that I just created, and now we can import our blocks, and it looks like this. Um, import blocks. Uh, pruning 
archive. And then I just give it the name of the file, which was blocks.json. And it gives you the same message that it gives you when you first start up a node for the first time. And then it says imported 13 blocks. So that all looks good and normal. So now if I just start my chain again, uh, great. We start over at 13 right where we left off. And like maybe we'll just double check that that restore worked. So this thing still says that we're on block number 13. We can still see that Alice's balance is low and uh, so is Bob's. Where did we send those tokens? Oh no, Bob's is high. So I think our first transfer was sending tokens from Alice to Bob and so that worked. And like maybe just to make sure our chain still works after the export purge and re-import, then we'll have like Alice send some tokens to like Ferdy, I guess. Yeah, so Alice's balance is even lower and Ferdy's is high now. So cool, I think we successfully exported and imported. And so migrations are tricky. And like, obviously if you have a live chain like Kusama or something that is, uh, you know, lots of blocks long and the state is not easily disposable, then this is a good thing to just know how to do. And then you can use it for testing your storage migrations before you do them in the wild. Um, can you export from RocksDB and import to ParityDB? Oh, wow. That's a good question. I don't know. Let's, let's try it. Also, like what DB am I using by default? Right. Rocks Probably DB. rocks, I guess. Uh, I don't even know how to know what DB I'm using. Yeah, so it's database. Yeah, it's uh, it's rocks <laughs> what was that? What was that? There's copy this icon. icon. Here yeah, and logs. Yeah, and logs. Okay. In the log, it says database rocks DB. Oh, totally. Yep. There we go. Okay. okay. So I exported I from exported RocksDB. From... So let's just, let's just try. Um, original binary. We'll give it a, uh, wait a second. I want to do import blocks and then we'll give it a different base path. We'll just do like temp, uh, 30, I guess. And, um, then I, what do I have to tell it? I think that's it. And then, oh yeah. Uh, blocks. What did I call that? Dot JSON? How do I tell it uh, database? I guess like oh. we should just. They used to help, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, database, select database, database select back, database, back in the users. users. Okay, okay. I don't really know how to spell really it, but maybe, it, it's like, like, maybe it's like. Okay, that seemed to work. Uh, so it seemed like that did not work. State database error, expecting pruning mode constrained. I don't think this is gonna fix it. Validator should run with the state pruning disabled. Yeah, I, okay, I think that didn't work. There might be a way to make it work, but I, I don't know what it is. So let's, okay, so let's get our normal node back up and running. Um, Spec JSON, and then uh, I guess that's all we did. Okay, seems like it's running and we're at block 14, which is where we left off, so so all good. Okay, cool, so um, let's look at the code of map set real quick and then we can do our last runtime upgrade. So that's in palettes and basically map set is supposed to be an alternate implementation compared to vec set. They, they solve the same thing, but in different ways. So let's look at its code. A uh, palette that implements a storage set on top of a storage map and demonstrates performance trade-offs compared to vec sets. So the big difference, the configuration trait looks exactly the same. The big difference is here in the storage. So if you remember in VEC set, we had a single storage item called members and, um, and it was, uh, 
it was a VEC, it wasn't a map, it was a VEC of account IDs. And so what we've done now is we've made instead a map. Uh, you always have to supply your hasher when you're making a map, uh, which, is, which is fine. And um, I'm mapping from account ID to bool. And so the comment sort of explains up here like, this bool is not really used for anything and I wish it weren't there. I wish I could just map from account ID to unit because all I really care about is the keys. I'm, I'm basically making a set here, so I don't really need any values. But there's this like weird, subtle, I don't even know if you call it a bug or just like the semantics of, of how this all works. And when you encode unit with parity scale codec, it encodes to zero bytes. And so when you query from off chain, like if we were to do this, where I have unit here, and then we were to query from off chain, like, hey, is Alice in this map, then like, uh, I don't even know where in the stack it is. It's, I don't think it's Polkadot API. I think it's like something about substrate storage, but the punchline is it's unable to distinguish between a zero byte value being there as opposed to this key being non-existent. And so if you use unit here, then you can't query from off chain to see if you're, um, you know, if that particular key is in the map. And so as a workaround, we just put a bool there. And by convention, um, the bool is always going to be always going to be set to true. I, I think that there is a. Um, I, I think I saw a discussion recently about this, and I think it's a sort of a purposeful design decision. And I think it might be at the storage layer of frame or substrate. Like they were talking about how the contracts module uh, palette m might do this differently. To I like yeah. So the, the underlying database fun fundamentally could do it, but for reasons, for design reasons, I, I think it was for security reasons. They wanted to avoid having the state explode. I'm not sure anymore. Yeah, I, I, I also remember, remember thinking, like there, there was an issue in Substrate where Brian Chen asked, like, is this by design or whatever? And like, there was some back and forth and ultimately Gav said like, this is by design, it's how we want it to work. Um, like, I definitely don't feel like I have my head wrapped all the way around it, but it's, uh, I understand it well enough to know that this is the way to do it if you, uh, like, don't want to run into weird edge cases and stuff. So I guess, like, this, the second important difference is that when we were storing a vector, the vector was the only storage item. And now, because we're storing a map, we're adding another storage item that keeps track of how many total members are stored here. And um, the reason we're doing that is because in both versions of the palette, we have this maximum membership. And uh, the reason we have the maximum membership is so that we can put upper bounds on the time that it will take to do things like check if a member is in the, in the set or like add a member and, and stuff like that. And so these kinds of storage maps don't internally store their own size. And so we're gonna store the size here in, a, in another storage item. So migration wise, basically what we have to do is take all of the items out of the vector from Vexet and put them as keys into this map. And then the other thing we have to do is just read the size of the original vector and store it into this member count. And once we've done that, then we'll consider our, our chain sort of like fully upgraded and compatible. I don't think there's too much more that I need to show in here. Um, I mean like, Definitely the way you add a member and stuff looks a little different because we're using a map now, but this isn't really anything that's different from any other map. You know, we just check like, does it already contain this member? And if so, we throw the error. Um, I guess one other thing that's different is like, we didn't have this line before because we weren't manually checking the, or we weren't manually maintaining the size of our uh, membership set. And so every time we add a new member, we have to remember to increment the, the like size counter and same thing. We have to remember to decrease the size counter when we remove a member. So, okay. Yeah. So, so here we go. I also just, I also noticed a uh, like kind of a bummer thing. I made a little mistake in this palette uh, right here where I should have called this map set. And it's actually, now that I think about it, because we haven't used the map set palette yet, it's not too late. So I'm just gonna fix that right now. Uh, and these are gonna be relevant because we need to know them for when we're doing our storage migrations, which I'll talk about basically right now, or really, really soon, I guess. 
let's do the sort of trivial parts of this migration first. So in our runtime, in our migration station runtime, we're gonna increment our spec version to three. We're gonna put our impl version uh, back down to one because this is the first implementation of spec version number three. And I think that is gonna be good to go. Now that we read about authoring version and transaction version, I'm a little bit paranoid about like, uh, I guess what I'm wondering is, do we need to worry about changing any of the dispatchables? I don't think we do, but uh, bo bottom line is we, we saved our database. So if this all goes horribly wrong, then we'll just redo it correctly. So we are done with VEC set. We're gonna impl map set trait for runtime. Okay, that looks fine. Um, I guess we didn't include map set in our dependencies yet, so we can do that. That looks good. Uh, here we go. Default features, false, okay. Um, all right, I think that's good. So back in our runtime, uh, the final thing we need to do is, oh no, sorry, not final yet, that was wrong. Include it here. Module, call, storage, events with generic parameters. Okay, so uh, the final thing we need to do is update the way that we've coupled the check membership palette. So we're no longer coupling to VEXet because we're removing VEXet out of the runtime and instead we're gonna couple to map set. Okay, so if this were a new runtime, like if we were starting a brand new chain from this runtime, we would be good to go. It has everything it needs, the palettes are installed, they're coupled together the correct way. But what we haven't done yet is the, um, the migrations and so that's what we're going to do and let me just commit all of this stuff so that i don't lose it um so i'll just say like uh well cecile you'll like this wip <laughs> uh and the so the reason that i wanted to do that is because i want to just do a checkout real quick of my prep work so that i can copy it and show you guys what i did because i learned something this morning that i didn't know yesterday when i was preparing and uh, I'll tell you when, when we get there. So. so right now we're on this like live seminar branch. That makes sense, we're live on seminar. So I'm gonna uh, check out seminar prep. So in this branch, here's our migration station runtime. It, it has the, uh, I've done the same stuff I did before where like, check membership loose is coupled to map set. Um, VEX set is removed. I, apparently I didn't comment it, I just deleted it. And the, the thing that I did last time is I installed this migrations palette and I implemented its trait and everything. And I, I actually do want to explain what it does and why I did it this way. But what I learned this morning is that there actually is a nicer way to do this. And so I think we'll try it the nicer way today. So here's my palette. It's pretty basic. It has this configuration trait with nothing interesting in it. It has some events that I was trying to use for debugging, but honestly, these never really worked out the way I wanted. I'm not sure if I can actually emit events during storage migrations, so that would not really be necessary. And so here's what I did. I, I have my decal module, you know, like in general, you could have a bunch of dispatchables in here and everything, or you could have like on finalize, on initialize, off chain worker, blah, blah, blah. The, the final special one is this on runtime upgrade. And so anytime your runtime goes through an upgrade, any palette that exists after the upgrade, the very first thing it does is calls this on runtime upgrade function for each palette. And to me, it didn't make sense to put this code inside of the map set implementation for my membership set. And the reason is 
map set is a perfectly good standalone palette ready to be used as it is. So like, you know, as I said earlier, if we were writing our original runtime using map set, it's perfect the way it is. There's no storage migrations that need to be done. And so I didn't want to sort of like taint that already correct palette with storage migrations that are specific to the runtime we're working in now. And that is, I, I think, uh, even considering what I learned today, that's a correct observation. Like this code should not go in map set because uh, map set already works the way it is. Um, what I learned this morning is like, you don't have to create a special palette just for these migrations. It's actually possible to uh, write migration code directly in the runtime. And so that's, that's what we'll try now, although I haven't done it before. But I guess while we're looking at it, let's just look through the migration code. So at a high level, as I already explained, we basically need to read the vector of members out of the old storage. We need to insert the length of that vector into the dedicated length tracking storage item in the new palette. So here's the first part. We let this like vec of members and it's, uh, you know, this type probably looks familiar. It's a vector of an account of account IDs but it's gonna, we're gonna get back an option here. And the reason is because I'm using this take storage value thing here. Let me get this get stuff out of the way. That gives us a little more screen real estate. And what I'm doing with this take storage value is I'm calling directly into raw storage. And so when you're calling storage, you have to provide like, essentially you have to provide the underlying storage key for where this data is stored. So the way substrate storage works is it's just one ginormous key value store. And it's like, wait, what do you mean it's one key value store? We have all those different maps in our palettes and individual storage items. And what frame does when you use that decal storage module is it creates the, like gives you this nice strongly typed interface that lets you use the underlying storage mechanism in a nice way. So now that we're doing migrations, we're getting a little more lower level. And when I call take storage value here, basically what I'm doing is I'm reading where do we want to take our storage from. So this should be vec set. There's, there's always three items. So there's the name of the palette. There's the name of the storage item within that palette. And then the third one is if it's a storage map, then you also provide the, the key for that map. So in our original vec set palette, there's no map. So we just go to the vec set palette the members storage item and we leave this empty because there's no value there. Oh, here's a little tiny mistake. Um, but, but what if we want to iterate uh, over um, map storage item and we need to some way to, to get uh, all the keys so we don't know all the keys? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, there's, there's a trait for that. there's this iterable storage map trait that you can use to iterate over the key value pairs of your map. This is not super new, but it's like kind of new, I think within the last couple months, it's really cool. Um, so, so that's what you can, it, yeah, our case, our use case right now is kind of the opposite. Like if we were going from the, the map set implementation to the VEC set implementation, we would need to use this trait to iterate over our keys in our map and then add them into a vector. Uh, okay, so I, here's the thing I realized that I had done wrong before. Uh, what I really want is just to get this vec back, and so I have to un unwrap this thing that I'm going to take right out of storage. Um, anyway, so we've got our vec of members now. Um, I, like I said, these events, I couldn't really see those events, so I'm not sure what's up with that. Um, and so now, okay, we're going to do this first storage insert. And the way we're going to do it is we go to map set. That's the new place where our, we want our new storage values to go. And then the storage item is called member count. And again, this one is not a map. It's just a regular U32 storage value. So I just take the length of that vector and I go ahead and insert it in there. Um, another debugging event that, you know, that didn't really pan out. Now here's the main migrations. We're going to iterate over each member in that vector of members that we had already. Um, this is a little bit gnarly. We have to come up with the correct key to put into the storage map and we have to do the hashing manually. So I, I should also say, Sean was telling me this morning, there's a nicer way to do this. I did not have time to figure that out and I don't hundred percent understand it. Uh, but 
regardless, we're learning some cool things about storage here. So let's roll with this for now. Yeah, so we hash each member with this Blake2128 hasher. And so now we can go ahead and actually put into our new storage item, the palette is called map set. The uh, members is the name of the storage item. This time we do need a map key because we're inserting into a map. That's what we got right here. And then, like I said before, the bool is irrelevant. Like ideally we wouldn't even care about it, but we're just gonna use true by convention. And then finally this on, uh, what's it called? On runtime upgrade it has to return a weight. And I, full disclosure, put literally no effort into characterizing how much time this takes to execute. Like in the real world, you would want to do that, but, but for now we're, we're not doing that. Um, I just saved a change. I don't know what it was. What's different there? Oh, vec map versus vec set. Yeah, that was, uh, okay, so I'll just commit that real quick, uh, fix typo. So I think uh, what Sean meant is that you can probably you like call the map set and just call put on there. Yeah, I think that would be like, I also took that to be like the big picture thing he was saying, but I didn't really understand exactly how to do it. I think that's a great idea because like, this is super dangerous. Like you saw, I had a typo in here that would have totally not worked. Do, Alex, do you feel like you know how to do that? I'm not sure I can improvise it right now, but in principle, it should just be about getting the type of the storage item of that yeah. storage map yeah. from the palette. So it should be palette colon colon um, members colon colon. Um, yeah. And yeah. then put, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, okay, me either. So let's do this then. Let's like, oh wow, we're down to eight minutes already? Holy moly. Uh, that kind of makes me want to try it with this palette, even though I know that's not the, the best way to do it, just so we can get something done. Let's, okay, let's do that. Let's try it this way that I already coded up. And then if it works, we'll go back to our, or either way, we'll go back to our restored, like, save the blockchain and try it again directly in the runtime. Uh, so that's all committed. That's good. So get check out uh, live seminar. And then I just want to grab that file that we were just looking at, which came from seminar prep. And it was called, uh, let's see, it was called runtimes um, migration station source migrations.rs. Dang. Runtimes, migration station, source. There was a typo in your path. And micro, my, mi, migratinos. <laughs> the final. Oh, question. thank you. Hooray, there we go. <laughs> um, so now we have this file, that's great. So yeah, let's just see if it works. Uh, basically, we just need to install this palette in our runtime now. Impl migrations trait for runtime. Do. Uh, I think that's it. Oh no, event. Okay, let's see if that compiles. Cargo build release dash p migration station. So again, like this cute little name I gave it, that's the name of our runtime. Ah. And uh, since I coded this palette right here in the same directory, we don't have to put it in our cargo Tomal. All we have to do, like, I don't know where to do this. I guess, uh, I guess right here is bring it into scope like that. Okay, cool. That seems good. Uh, so let me copy it. Target release w build migration station compact at wasm and I'll copy it to call it upgrade three. 
that compact that was them. There it is. Okay, cool. So our chain is still live. Uh, I'm just going to double check real quick that I bumped the, the version. I think I did. Yeah, we're up to three now. Okay, cool. So in our user interface, we'll go to sudo and we're on block 14 right now, version two. Um, so let's get that code upgrade three. We'll override the weight again and, uh, and we'll submit it. Okie dokie. So we got a new block and we got up to runtime version three. So that's good. Our logs all say everything's good. Okay. So then, uh, now's the moment of truth. See if we got any of that stuff, right? Um, map set member count. I think it should be two. Oh no. Um, let's check about seeing if like Alice or Bob are in here. Hmm. So this was my curiosity, I guess. I was never sure if my upgrades were running or not. And like in Vexet, so one thing I noticed when I was practicing this is that when you do one of these upgrades, the old palettes that get removed always stay there until you refresh the UI. So we get like a second here to just look. Yeah, so it still has the data over here, which, which is confusing to me and makes me think something wasn't working because in our migrations code, I actually used take storage, which is supposed to like remove the storage out of the old location. Uh, and then like, okay, so we did that in block 15. So we see some of these events, like we see code updated and we see the pseudo thing and that all looks good. But what I don't see is like, you know, like I was saying, any of these events that I was trying to emit here as debugging, those ones didn't seem to go through. Hey everybody, it's Future Joshi. I just wanted to explain something that I learned since we did this demo at the seminar. That upgrade actually did work correctly and we just failed to know about a subtlety. So when you submit a runtime upgrade, it goes into some particular block. In our example, that was block 15. And the storage migrations or all of those on runtime upgrade functions like the one we were just writing are actually executed as the very first thing that happens in the next block, so in block 16. So whenever block 16 comes along, those migrations will be written and then the data would look the way we expected. In our scenario, we never sent another transaction, so we never got block 16, so I was correct in concluding that we have indeed not executed those upgrades yet. Now this isn't a problem for any transactions, because as soon as we send any transaction, the upgrades are going to run first, so you'll never be able to transact with like improperly migrated state. But it is confusing if you're reading the state from off chain like I tried to do in this example. So unfortunately I didn't, uh, I got, I was confused and I thought it didn't work and I, I pressed on, um, but that upgrade did go through successfully and we'll see that later. And uh, future Joshi will be back to show that later on in the, in the video. So let's just try to do it the way that, uh, that Sean was recommending as being better anyway and see what happens then. So he linked to this PR, add support for custom runtime upgrade logic. And uh, basically the idea is when you're in the situation I described that we're currently in, where you're basically upgrading like the configuration of your runtime, but we didn't change anything specific to the map set palette. This is apparently like the recommended way to uh, do those runtimes in the upgrade at the upgrade level. So let's just copy this code and see what happens. Um, so I'm going to put it right in the migration station lib.rs. Uh, see, yeah, I don't even, I honestly don't know where to do it. I think like here, let's just try here. Uh, oh, we don't need that. Um, and uh, so let's just take our code from over here. I guess we don't need the events. So basically, I, and, you know, just to make sure everybody's still following, I'm just taking the same code I was already using and putting it directly in the runtime, and I'm getting rid of these events that didn't seem to do what we wanted anyway. So that includes this one. The indentation is super wonky now. <laughs> That's okay. 
make it look a little better if we can. Um, yeah, okay. So hopefully that'll be right. And it's, it's funny, like I feel pretty comfortable just running this again because we actually saw that the old storage is still in the correct storage location. So that should be good. So let's just see what happens if this even works. I'm just curious about that. Oh, I guess we have to co uh, compile it again. Oh, I might need to bring some traits into scope here. Previous edition of type uh, executive, okay. So this is the old one. Um, and I'm just going to ditch it. So I, I do not have a clear understanding of what all this does. But what I do know is that in the one I copied from that PR, we added to the right side one that says something about runtime upgrades. So let's just, uh, whoops, comment that one out. And then I'll show you what I meant. Um, that was right here. So it has all the same stuff plus this one, custom on runtime upgrade which custom on runtime upgrade is this struct that I made here. So let's try again. Ah, uh, yeah, so all this stuff about T is gonna be different, but luckily we have the type account ID right here in scope. What other errors did we have? Line 261, use of undeclared type or module, executive. Uh, okay, so let's look back at the PR. They brought in frame executive. Uh, okay, I can't find takes. Okay, so that was uh, something that I imported up here in the migrations one. So I'll move it back to the runtime. I guess I'll just put it first. And then now that I'm thinking about it, we really don't want to be doing the migration both ways. So let's get rid of this stuff. Yep. And. Uh, we also can bump this to four. So I, I mean, I guess everybody can tell I'm kind of experimenting and learning as we go now, but let's just see if we get something useful. And we can wrap up the seminar shortly. Context not found in this scope. Darn, I was feeling so confident. The Blake 128 hasher is an easy one. You just need to bring in this trait hashable. No. Use frame support hashable. The other one, I'm not so sure about context. Uh, this is what they did. System, they, in the old one, they had system chain context of runtime. So that seems about right. And in the PR, maybe I'll just double check. Context equals system. Yeah, OK, so that's what we have to do. No problem. And in the recipes, I've been not aliasing these crates. So that's why we need frame system there. Whoops. Okay, that's no problem. We don't need to do anything about that. Okay, cool. So it compiled. So that's probably good. So let's just copy it. Target. This will be our last exercise. And if it works, then great. And if not, then I'll make it work and I'll edit it into the seminar recording when we're done. Um, let's see, where did that come from? Migration station. And I'll just copy it to uh, upgrade4.compact.wasm. Boom, that looks good. And so over here, we can submit our transaction. So I'm about to do this second attempt at the upgrade on top of the same chain state where we did the first one. That's going to cause block 16 to be authored, and that's going to cause the migrations from the first attempt to actually be applied. I did not understand what was happening at the live seminar recording, as I said, but you'll be able to see it in this demo.
Okay, so it went through again. We're up to version four again. Let's see if we actually got anything migrated this time. Hey, that looks good. Okay, our VEX set is empty this time. Let's see if we got stuff into the right place. Hey, our member count is two. Alice is in there. Bob is in there. Charlie should not be, if I remember correctly. Okay, that's good. So let's try our extrinsics then. Check membership. We'll call it as Alice. And, ooh, interesting. What is that? So when I tried to submit that transaction, that caused block 17 to be authored, which tried to apply the second set of storage migrations. And the second set definitely wasn't going to work because we already did the migrations in the first set. So that's why that transaction failed. So let me just go back to our saved blockchain state and do this the correct way with the understanding that we've now gained and you can see how it works. So right now I'm on version two, block 13. I just restored the backup we made. So it's a good thing we made that backup. And I guess we can go ahead and make sure like transfers still work and everything. Transfers is just a sanity check I like to do to make sure the chain is like operating normally. And that worked fine, so let's go ahead and submit our upgrade. I'm just going to go ahead and submit it. Okay, so that all looks good. And if we look at our Explorer in block 15, we can see that we did uh, update the code and sudo was successful and all that stuff. Now, here's an what seems like an oddity that's actually a property of how these upgrades and migrations work. So if I go to my chain state tab right now, we just did an upgrade. We haven't had any blocks since then. And I query like my map set for member count still says zero. And it's like, well, that doesn't look like my storage migrated. And these migrations run as the very first thing that happens in the next block after the runtime upgrade. And that block hasn't come yet. So we can kick it off in any number of ways. I could make a transfer or something, but I don't want to leave you with the impression that any user facing extrinsic would ever end up in this weird mismatched, like migrations not yet run situation. So um, what I actually want to do is show you, you know, again, another way to look at this is to say, if we query the storage, we see that Alice is not yet in there. And again, that's because our migrations haven't run yet. But if I go to the extrinsics tab and I call check membership and I make any kind of on-chain transaction like Alice checking her own membership, then we can see that succeeded. And it's like, okay, well then Alice must have been a member. And because we just submitted that transaction, it caused a new block to be authored and that caused the migrations to run before Alice's transaction. So now if we go back and look at our chain state and look at map set and see that both of our members are in there, that's Alice and Bob. And I can see explicitly that indeed Alice is in there now that the uh, migrations have run. And so everything worked as expected. All right, so I'm back again. I just wanna show you the final iteration of this code that does the migrations from right here in the runtime. So I've cleaned stuff up a little bit. This indentation is not messed up anymore and made other little changes like that. So I'm, I'm in our migration station runtime in the librs file, and I'm looking at this custom on runtime upgrade struct. This is where we put our migration code um, in, the, in the previous demo. So the change I've made this time is that I'm using fewer of the untyped sort of dangerous storage uh, modifying functions. So I begin by bringing in some structs from our map set palette specifically the ones that represent our storage values, members and member count. And then things proceed similarly to before. So I, I still use this sort of dangerous or error prone way of taking the old storage vector from the Vexet palette. And the reason I did that is because we no longer have a dependency on Vexet in our runtime. We removed that palette. So I couldn't do something like bringing this in. Now, if you really like this strongly typed thing that I'm about to show, you can leave Vexet as a dependency and, and bring in, you know, its own members type too. So once we have the, the VEC of members read, now we, you know, we like before, we insert the total size of that set into the new map set storage. But instead of using this like dangerous put storage value, instead I'm using member count just like I would if I were in the map set palette. So I just call its put method and I give it a value and this does the type checking and every, you know puts it in the right spot in storage no opportunity for me to like make a typo with one of these things 
And then same thing for the individual members. We still iterate over the entire vector of members like we did before. And then we use the runtime, the member storage item from the map set palette to insert the members as keys and just this like dummy true as the values. Now the one thing that looks a tiny bit different than if you did this in the map set palette is that if you were in the palette, this would just be a T, uh, something of you know type trait of specifically map sets configuration trait. And in the runtime, the thing that we're ultimately implementing that trait for is the runtime. And so we just pass that there. And otherwise this code is, is exactly the same and it works exactly the same too. So maybe we can do the demo. So we're picking up right where we left off at block 13 and I'll open my user interface. And we can go ahead and submit our extrinsic to do the upgrade. So since I cleaned things up a little bit, I did rename this to upgrade three. So it's eventually gonna become like a real recipe or tutorial or something. And we're gonna skip all those parts from the seminar about doing like the migrations palette and everything. So it's called uh, upgrade three right now. And we'll just put the weight of one. Okay, looks great. And since we're now smart enough to know that the migrations don't run until the next block, let's just make our first query this kind where we do check membership and we'll check for Charlie and he should not be a member. Boom, and he's not, that's great. So we'll check with Alice and she should be a member and she is, so that's great. And then, you know, now that the migrations have run, we can check our storage items. two members and in Vexat, no members. So that all worked great and we got a little bit more type safety and a little less uh, hair pulling when coding our migrations. So I missed most of the seminar. Would, uh, would a recording be available of this one? Yeah, for sure. Yep, I'm gonna spend the rest of the day posting last week's recording and this recording and uh, if, if I get whatever that bug we hit at the end was sorted out, it'll be available today. But if it takes me an hour or two, maybe tomorrow, but it'll be available for sure. Um, where do you post it? Oh, good question. Let me just, let me just show you. So the main jumping off point for all three things seminar is this substrate.io slash seminar. And, um, at the bottom is links to the most recent oh. recording. So uh, okay. today there'll be two more of them updated here. And I guess just like, if okay. we just follow yeah. one of those, then it takes us to a Substrate Seminar playlist. Oh, I dig that the, the screenshot of this one has David chilling. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it'll, it'll be there definitely in the next 24 hours, hopefully in the next eight hours, but you know how debugging goes. So, oh, that, all right. That's great. Cool. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. It was awesome to see you guys again. And, uh, and we'll see you next week. Okay, cool. See you. Yep. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Joshi. Yeah, thanks a lot.